All right, what's up, guys? We are back with another podcast episode. This week, we're going to be talking about some Proton updates and X40 sale that is probably only going on today, maybe tomorrow, uh, recapping MLP. And then we also want to talk about if spin should actually be uncapped in pickleball. That's some people have been talking about lately. And I don't know. I have some thoughts on that that we should go over. But anyways, let's start with this. So first, thank you to everyone who bought a melon hat. Yes. uh, Because melon emailed me the day after and told me how many hats you guys bought. And you guys bought a lot, a lot of hats. Like all went crazy. You guys literally bought probably 10 to six anywhere between like six and 10 times more hats than I think I thought were going to get used. Yeah. And it seemed like melon was very happy with the amount of hats that were bought. So we might be able to work something out more in the future. So just want to say thanks to everyone who bought one. And also if this is the first time you've owned one, one thing that I forget about is that when they're new, the hats are actually pretty stiff. So if you're not used to stiff hats, just be aware that it's going to be stiff. And eventually it breaks in and loosens up like yeah. I, several. My oldest melon hats are a lot looser than my newest melon Once hats. Once you wash it a couple times, playing it, washing it, they they start to yeah break in, feel nice, soften up. Yep. They're, they're great. So just be aware of that if that's something uh, you don't tend to like. It's just something I've gotten used to, so I just don't even think about it anymore. But yep. just be aware. All right. Next thing. X40s, so Prime Day stuff is going on right now, and it looks like uh, Franklin's doing a big sale. So, 100 pack of Franklin balls you can buy for $129. And then, if you go to their website, a little coupon will pop up. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you get 20% off. So, basically, you can get 100 balls for nearly $100. Yeah. So, Do- this, dollar ball is uh, it's hard to beat, man. Uh, yeah. That's it's. I haven't seen a deal like this in. A while yeah especially for the x40 i mean people are playing with it more now with how much people dislike the vulcan ball uh, i know a lot of groups i play in are actually going back to vol or sorry back to x40s yep. and i personally have been uh much preferring the franklin over everything else right now yeah so. the only thing is that it's soft but like i don't think i really even care i mean it yeah. fits my game style better anyways it just makes the game more fun more entertaining more more resets more hands battles like better points yeah so, which is yeah. funny because i never thought i'd hear myself say that after like when it was Duran franklin it was like oh why are we using either of these well at the time i franklin's qc on the hundred packs can be a little dodgy mm. so just be aware of that but yeah i don't know i've been i've been fine with it so i ordered 200 this morning <laughs> nice I was like you know what i still have like some balls from the original hundred pack i bought like years ago so i'm sure 200 is gonna last so forever. now we're gonna be getting uh a when once your home court gets built it's gonna be a twenty thousand overhead drill oh my God. <laughs> yeah, i probably need like a hundred thousand overheads before that shot's fixed oh my gosh i know uh but anyways yeah if you guys want to pick that up make sure you do it quickly because yes I think they said it's only 48 hours and I don't know if that sale started today when we're recording this podcast or the day before. So if you mm-hmm. want that, you should order that as soon as this pod goes up. Yeah, um, for sure. Okay, so we're actually re-recording this section of the podcast because originally when we recorded this, Charles had not responded to my email and then as I was exporting this podcast, I got a response uh, with uh, from his email and in the spirit of fairness, I wanted to include that because I think it would be unfair to not include his response given what we talked about uh, earlier. So, all right, here this goes. So first I'm going to, I'll read his response and then I'll kind of go into uh, my original email a little bit. So he says, Chris, since September of last year, we have many athletes, both professional and amateur competing in APP, USAP, PPA, and MLP. And until the event last weekend, which would be APP Newport, we have not had a Series 1 paddle fail on-site testing. This is something we are very proud of, also considering many of these athletes were able to use their same Series 1 paddle across multiple tournaments for months. Now, one thing I want to address here, and we'll get into it more as I talk about what I emailed him with my questions, but on-site testing for APP consists of a grit check which is a steric so that's useless on a proton because there is no grit it's smooth then there is also a core uh like corruption test which is kind of like this ultrasonic scanner 
which checks if the core has any failures. That's it. Those are the only two things. And they're Gen 1 construction, right? And these are Gen 1 construction. Okay. So, so it's unlikely that the core is going to fail. Yep. So yes, of course, it's not going to fail any on-site testing because the thing that people are worried about with the protons, which is the coefficient of friction, which is a test that USAP has, you can only have so much friction on your paddle, they don't do that in person. Yep. So I want to make that clear. In my opinion, that is why nothing has failed on-site testing. And if USAP became aware that the paddles were different, that is likely why at APP Newport, they were like, wait, what we got sent and what is in the market is different. That makes sense to me. Yep. Anyways, we'll continue with the email. I just want to interject thoughts as we go. It is wrong for any testing entity at an event to use a non-scientific method to deem a paddle non-conforming, even more so by simply rubbing their hand on it. The timing of this is also concerning, and we are addressing this head on. This goes back to what I was just saying a minute ago, a little bit, is, okay, yes, they aren't obviously doing the real friction test in person, but the paddle I felt, I promise you 10 out of 10 people would touch the proton that I have or the protons in the wild and this one, and not a single person would mix them up. One of them, when you rub your hand on it, is like this table. Like, my finger slides right across it. The proton just stops. It like sticks or stops a little bit. So yep. I do agree with him. You should be doing like a more scientific test, but given that it's so obvious that one is like smooth as glass with no friction and the other one actually has friction and resistance on it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to like figure out, okay, these are probably different. But I do I do think what he's saying here is valid. Like yep, if you're going to pull something out, you should probably use the real test. Mm -hmm. All right. Then he says... Andre, the APP player of the year, used the same two paddles from September through May and never had a paddle fail testing. We also have multiple athletes in the PPA and MLP where they actually perform scientific testing on site with not one Series 1 paddle failing testing. Again, uh, PPL, their testing consists of a deflection test and a stare at test. Neither of which are going to fail friction exactly so again that makes sense and it's a gen 1 construction so it makes sense why it wouldn't fail those tests because it's not really testing for the thing that the proton is built yeah like what makes it so great right so that part kind of mute point to me next we have our own internal lab or sorry we have our own internal testing lab have acquired testing paid for by accredited labs as well as the testing performed by independent paddle reviewers like yourself all confirming that our rpm and exit velocity are similar to other high performance paddles with no unusual outcome or significant differentiation aside from the fact that our spin and performance will last for much longer without degradation found common with most paddles on the market today here's what i want to say about this first he doesn't name the accredited labs yep. but i already know he's talking about pickle pro labs because he mentioned that in the pickleball central video which if you guys listen to this podcast, you probably haven't gotten to that part of the podcast yet, but we'll come back to that. He doesn't mention if USAP is one of those. And then he says, our RPM and exit velocity, which are not things that currently are being tested for. Yes, USAP announced a new test, and maybe some of the manufacturers have that data, but it's not something like public. Mm -hmm. And there is no RPM test. Right. USAP is a friction test and a grit test. PPL, to my knowledge, is only a grit test. And I know they're working on other tests in the future. Mm -hmm. So again, these things right here don't matter because it's not testing the thing that the proton gets its spin from. Right. Then he said, we are proud of our engineering, bringing new and innovative technologies to the market for the overall benefit of the players, wanting them to get good, long-lasting value out of their paddle purchase. I hope you find that same enjoyment out of the paddles you just received and are impressed with the way we built them. I am still eager to have a conversation with you at some point and we'll get into each of these questions you have asked. I hope soon to get on the positive side of your podcast after we, able to, after we are able to prove out our dedication to the players and commitment to better technology for the sport. Looking forward to your feedback on the new paddles. I can assure you they were built maximizing the allowable compliance thresholds while maintaining those levels for a long, long time, providing great value to the players that buy them. And then that concludes the email. I just have so many things 
I want to go over in this. Mm -hmm. Um, First, one thing he says right here, I am still eager to have a conversation with you at some point and we'll get into each of the questions you have asked. So I don't know if he's addressing right here like, hey, we will talk about the questions you asked, but I'm not going to put them in an email, in which case I'm like, okay, but why? My questions are pretty black and white and I'll read those right now. My questions in the original email were one in Texas. You mentioned you have gone through five or maybe seven different versions of the protons with small tweaks. Have all of these variations been submitted to USAP Two. Back quite, back quite some time ago, there was another brand that focused on spin via friction rather than grit. Their paddle was actually over the legal friction limit and got pulled quietly from USAP and then had to be updated to be put back in spec with USAP's coefficient of friction guideline. This paddle got much less spin after the update and the original one with more friction was substantially less tacky than the current protons. So my question would be, If my paddle or any Proton Series 1 were submitted for friction testing, would they pass right now? I'm trying to understand in my head how these could possibly have, how these could have substantially more friction than the paddle I was talking about and still pass. I assume there may be something I am missing as a potential reason. Okay, those are my questions. Does it sound like a single one of those was answered in that email? Not a single one. Nothing, nothing was addressed. And to your point, those are pretty clear Easy black and white questions. Yes. And this is a pretty long response dodging all of those. Yes. I, it just feels so clear to me. Like the first question, have you submitted all of the different iterations to USAP? Literally yes or no. Yes or no. That's it. And then as far as the friction one, like sure, he cannot answer if my personal paddle will fail a friction test, right? Like, right. There's a lot of things that could vary. So I understand that you can't stamp a guarantee on it. But if you believe in the technology you're using, your answer would probably be, yes, our proton paddles are within the friction limit. Mm -hmm. And I just don't understand. Like, I guess we'll go over this now because I'll probably just replace the entire section where we talked about proton. I actually had followed up with a third question because he did a Pickleball Central interview. And the long story short is... There is a test, the Starrett test, which is the grit checker for these paddles. What the Starrett does is it drags a little needle across the face and it measures how high the peaks and valleys are. And then it tells you like the difference between the lowest and highest point or whatever. So the higher the number, the more gritty, the lower number, the more smooth it is. Yep. And for USAP, the limit is 30 RZ and 40 RT. You don't really need to know what RZ and RT stand for. You just need to know 30 and 40. Yep. In this Pickleball Central interview, he says, our paddles test at 47.4 as tested by Pickle Pro Labs. And he's very proud of that, which is cool, but Pickle Pro Labs only tests for pros at PPA and MLP. So it's useless for you and me. Mm-hmm. And that would be almost 20% over the legal limit for USAP. USAP. So right. when I first heard this, I was like, did they literally just say, basically, our paddles aren't legal for USAP? 20% over the limit. Yeah, like nearly. So, and he didn't address that at all in this email when I asked about it. So, to me, again, these questions are pretty black and white. Like, let me go, let me scroll up to this email and just see what I asked when I asked about the Series 3, just to be fair. Um, I said, in this video around the 420 mark, you talk about having the roughest raw carbon fiber paddle on the market. You cite that it comes in at 47.4 RT and that it was done by Pickle Pro Labs. Pickle Pro testing, Pickle Pro Labs testing is only used for pro events, PPA and MLP events, and does not apply to the amateurs. USAP uses a different limit for their rules, and the limit is 30 RZ and 40 RT, which would make the Series 3 almost 20% over the legal limit. That would make the Series 3 not legal for amateur use for any USAP sanctioned event. I wanted to follow up with what you knew about this because that makes the paddles a bit problematic for the market. And again, this question was just completely dodged. All, yeah. The only thing that got talked about was the Series 1. And for those of you that don't know, RZ and RT, those numbers, the lower it is, the smoother that surface is going to be. And the higher the number it is, the rougher it's going to feel. Yeah. So if it's 29, it's going to feel smooth. Yeah. And if it's 46, it's going to feel very rough. And yeah. we even had one of these, and we have a Starrett, and we tested ours. Yeah, we only checked one axis because, again, still in the middle of a move, so like I didn't really have time to run the whole thing. But like the series three that I have is one of the roughest paddles I've ever touched. It's, in, it's insane. 
I mean, the Magnus that I put on my shirt that stuck in our uh, Gen 3 video, this, this, uh, was it? Series 3. Series 3 is so much more gritty than that Magnus. I mean, it puts it to shame. Yeah. It's insane. The RT rating was 82. Yeah, so we tested one axis. When you do the actual test, you do six different directions, and then you average those six numbers to get the final number. Yeah. And I only ran one number because it was just in my kitchen, and I was like, well, let's just see what it is. And in that one axis, we got 82 for RT. and Which like, is double the legal limit, yeah, over double. Over double the legal limit, and then 54 for RZ. Yeah. And for RZ, the limit is 30, and we got 54. So, of course, when you average it, usually on the stare it, there are different directions that are a higher number and then others that are lower. So the full average would probably be much lower. My right. guess is it wouldn't actually be twice as gritty as the next. The full average is not going to be twice, but it will still be, be over high. the legal limit. Yeah, I'd be absolutely dumbfounded if this paddle came back and was a, the average was below. Yeah. Of course, we should confirm that. And also, just know, guys, like, I'm not USAP. I am not the official lab. Like, I own a Starrett, and I like to check just to make sure there's nothing wrong with the paddles I receive. Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm not the official body. So, like, I can't say, oh, all these Series 3 are illegal, and, like, some paddles are rougher than others. But the one that I have, that I've never seen a number that high. I've right. tested a but lot of paddles. also very handy for us to have that device and test these things because if we didn't and we tested this paddle and said, hey, guys, this paddle gets... 2700 rpm it's amazing it's the highest spinning pedal we've ever gotten and then you order one as a consumer and now you're getting 1900 because you got a dud or maybe a legal one yeah and then now it, you're you know sending us comments saying oh you guys lied this doesn't get that good a spin it's blah 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 this and that like so yes we're not an official testing lab but it's still very useful for us to get these numbers and test these pedals because i mean really yeah at the end of the day all it's good for is mostly just like us verifying like okay, our paddle is kind of weird. Maybe we need to ask more questions, but like right. we can't do the test and then say like, oh yeah, all of these are illegal. Exactly. Like, that's not how that works. Yep. So I don't know, guys, like I have a lot of questions about these protons. Like hopefully Charles and I can have a conversation and get to the bottom of this. But given all of the things that are weird right now, APP who uses USAP as their testing is pulling paddles out of pro play. Yep. They were out of stock for five months. These surfaces are more tacky than anything that's currently on the market. And the only other paddle that I know was similar to this had a recall because it was too tacky. Mm -hmm. So like history is telling me someone has already tried this. It didn't work or it was over the legal limit. So I just that followed by like, you know, Proton loves to build up their paddles by bashing everyone else and saying like, our paddles are great because those guys suck. Yeah. Like their carbon fiber is cheap. We use great carbon fiber. And I really dislike that that marketing tactic. Like I've, I've been in sales. I've sold products. I know how this works. And I really just dislike when a company bashes on another company to make their product look better. If your product is actually better and different, tell me why it's unique and tell me what it does better. Don't tell me why the others suck. Yeah. You know? Exactly. And it just, there's so many small things that keep like adding up or stacking that make me go like, what is going on here? Like one of the things that it's not, I guess it's more just amusing to me, but like in that Pickleball Central video, Charles says like, if a pa carbon fiber paddle feels good the first time you hit it, it's using cheap carbon fiber. Like it's going to break down and it's not as good. And then immediately after that, he follows it up with, our series one feels good, but it, the sound's going to change. The sweet spot's going to get bigger. And I'm like, look, you can't trash on, let's just say everyone on this wall yep. and say, if it feels good, it means it's trash. And then immediately say, but ours feels good and it's going to change. And it gets better. And it gets better. So I'm like, you could just say like, yeah, ours doesn't feel that great when you hit it, but it will get better. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I've seen them do this a lot. And, and I like, still don't even really like that because as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, I'm just not a fan of this whole, you got to break your paddle in strategy. It's just the gearbox, the protons, all yeah. these different paddles. I just want a paddle to be sent in for testing. It get approved and that be what you play with. Yeah. I don't want you have to get something that sneaks through testing because it's worse at the beginning when you start playing with it and after a month or two now it's better yeah and wouldn't pass testing after that i yeah. just i'm very annoyed by that 
I mean, they say like, or at least he said in videos, like, you know, ours will get better and like still pass or whatever. But at this point, guys, who knows? Like, I'm sure I sound like the biggest Proton hater out there, but I'm not. Like, I'm actually excited about these paddles, but I there's so many questions. And in a time where the Yola Gen 3s are getting delisted, the Vatic Oni, the Ripple, um, like the Gearbox had weird things with break-in, like... I'm just a lot more cautious, and I think if you're going to spend almost $300 on one of these Protons, and they're being pulled out of Pro Play, like, I don't want to review one and then have it get put into question. Right. Like, oh, uh, all these people go and buy, let's say I say it's amazing, because I think some of the technology is really cool. Well, now you guys all go buy it, and if it gets delisted, like, you're mad again. Yep. People are already worried about buying paddles with new technology and getting delisted, which I totally understand. I'd be scared, too, after the last however many yeah and so with a paddle that's getting pulled out of pro play i'm like okay well we're we gonna do even, something about this and like can usap hurry up and like give us some answers like yeah. even paddles that aren't necessarily using new and different technology look at our last review on the uh six zero 14 millimeter paddles the black diamond the ruby there were people in that comment section saying oh i don't want to buy this because i don't know if it's going to get banned and that's using older technology yeah like it's stuff that isn't there should be zero worried about zero getting delisted. concern of get, getting banned or delisted, and people are still concerned about just because it's a new release. Yeah, and they're like, oh, I want to wait a few months and just see. Yeah, you know. So, especially with Proton, and again, I'm with Christopher. I don't hate Proton. I actually like some of what they're doing. I just want them to fall within all the regulations. Yeah, and and the thing is, we don't like. No one really knows. If it does or doesn't, I'm basing right. this off like prior knowledge and also like paddles being pulled out of play. Like there's no confirmation from USAP that yes, these are definitely legal. There's just signs that make you go, well, what's wrong here? Mm -hmm. Like what what's going on? So I don't know. I want to review these things. If they are completely legal, that is awesome. I would probably give these a great review given the characteristics that are being described, but when I can't even get a straight answer after, and just so you guys know, I had multiple follow-ups on this. So I shot him an email July 8th. It's currently July 16th. Uh, I didn't hear from him for a few days. And then he said he would get back to me that same evening, never got back to me. I followed up again this last Saturday, said, hey, just want to hear from you. And then um, he said we could do a phone call that weekend or Monday. I was at MLP, so couldn't do that. Yep. And then Monday, I just said, I was like, I would prefer to have this in writing so I don't have to recall a full hour-long phone call because I'll talk about this on the podcast. And then, you know, he didn't respond until today. And then when I get a response, it doesn't even give me any answers. Any answers Zero. to the things I asked. So you guys can draw your own conclusions. I'm going to try and stay in contact with Charles and get to the bottom of what is going on. But... For the time being, I'm just not optimistic about anything. I've been yeah. in this industry long enough and I've dealt with enough people and I just have a lot of red flags going off right now. Yep. Like and I've, even outside of the paddle technology and being it like having concerns of it getting banned or delisted or any of these things, forget about all the paddles. If I'm a consumer and I see people placing orders five months ago and not getting their paddles, that is going to deter me from wanting to Yeah purchase a paddle in general yeah so like there's just so many fishy sketchy things going on with the company that like again if i was a consumer wanting to buy a paddle there's too many red flags that would deter me from buying any of these paddles yeah yeah so there you guys go that's uh the current proton status i guess if there's more news next week we'll keep you updated take the information as you will and uh yeah, here's the next uh, section of the pod that we recorded earlier. One thing I just want to go over quick uh, with the slice cap. We talked about this an episode or two ago. Yep. Um, so I've had one on my Valer Forza Mach 2. I was playing it in Newport. And just one thing I noticed and people should be aware of is got to be careful with how much weight you go. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, static weight doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think when you're talking about static weight in really small differences, like, 8.0 versus 7.9 i'm like okay guys let's calm down it doesn't matter but when you're talking big jumps like my volare forza mach 2 is like 9.7 ounces 
that's a lot of weight. Yeah, when you're going from eight three to nine seven, like yeah. that's that's a big jump. You're going over an ounce. It's a lot. No matter how much counterbalance you add to the bottom of that paddle with like a slice cap or lead tape or whatever, you're still swinging all of that weight around. Yep. And I got to experience this very clearly. I actually ended up taking some of the lead off the head because I had the entire head wrapped. I took some off the head because it was just too heavy. The swing weight was only 119, which is completely reasonable. I've swung plenty of paddles that heavy yep. stock, but the static weight was a lot lower. What I noticed is that on rolls, I was having a really hard time accelerating quickly. And then in singles, even just my drives, I felt a little bit late and like I couldn't accelerate as fast as I wanted. So I took that some weight off the head and I did find that that, that helped. So if you are gonna use a slice cap and you're gonna use a one ounce cap, a lot of people right now are like, oh, it offsets all the weight that's in the head. Okay, in some ways, sure, but you're still increasing static weight, right? Like, let's say I put 10 pounds of lead tape in my handle. I'm being extreme for the sake of example here. I promise you that now you have the most headlight paddle in the world. It's still going to be super heavy. You're yeah. still swinging a 10 pound weight. Exactly. So just be aware to not go crazy, completely crazy with the weight. There is still a limit of like, I think certain shots are going to be impacted by that. And yeah, that's really all I wanted to say. From what I've tested with adding a bunch of weight to paddles, anything over 9.5 ounces is just getting unnecessary and too much. Yeah. I, I can I can deal with anything below 9.5 ounces, um, but past that just begins. I don't I don't see much benefit with going over that amount of weight. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. So just be aware of that. Also, again, if you guys are considering a slice cap, uh, I would strongly advise you use lead tape first. Yes. Like just wrap wrap some lead in the handle and see if you actually even care about adding weight to your butt because these things are expensive. They're like 30 bucks. And if you don't know that you like it, like you can try this at home. I do think that the slice cap is a more permanent solution is a little bit nicer. And I, again, I like how it flares out. It feels good in my hand. Not everyone's going to like that. I know you don't really. That's where we, we are opposites. I was just about to mention that. I'm actually very picky about the butt caps on my paddles. I've actually held a brand new paddle that I was going to play with, and the butt cap fell off, and I grabbed another fresh one because I didn't want to play with it because of how it felt. Yeah. Um, I don't like how much. I like that it's symmetrical, but I just don't like how much it flares. It's too big in my hands. Yeah. So it feels like it constricts me from certain grips. See, I like that because like, it just feels so like locked into my palm. It's like it sits here and just like locks in. Yeah, too chunky. It reminds me of how Patrick wraps his grips. Oh, 16 gosh. over grips, like just too much. Yeah, our other brother's insane. So yeah, anyways, I just wanted to say that the slice cap's not going to be for everyone. I like it, but you can totally add lead tape, guys. You don't have to buy this cap to do it. I just think it's potentially a good permanent solution if that's something you're like into. Yeah, totally. Cool. Okay, next up, uh, kitchen bag update. Yep. You and I have been using this for a while now. Eventually, we're going to do a review on this, but since it's an expensive bag, I just want to make sure that I put it through all its paces, see yep. what it can do. I've traveled two times with it now. Traveled to APP Newport, and that was the only bag I used at the tournament, so much smaller than I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And then when we went to Michigan for MLP, I also took the bag. Yeah. And so far, it's holding up really well. I mean, the like I haven't really had any issues. It is – sometimes I wish I had just a little bit more space. Mm -hmm. Like, again, sure. if it had, like, two more inches out the back, it would, I think, hold just a little bit more. But I've been able to make it work. Tournament days were super comfortable. The straps are nice. Like, I had that bag stuffed. Like, I could not add more to it. Yeah. And then uh, – <laughs> Jeez Louise. <laughs> there he goes. All right, there he goes. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, I could not have added any more to it, and it still felt good on my back. Sometimes I'm like, man, if I had just a little bit more storage, it might be nice. But I think when you're looking at this bag, you have to decide like what you want to use it for because I think you use different bags for different things. It's kind of like camera bags. Yeah. There's like an everyday bag, and then there's like I'm going to go film a wedding, and now I need a giant bag that holds everything. Yep. And I feel like this is the kitchen bag is more of an everyday bag as you can use for a tournament. But if you hold a lot of stuff, like if you're used to like a six zero bag that holds a ton, this bag just doesn't hold as it's, much. It's yeah, it's a different it's a different travel dynamic for sure. Um I think it's amazing for going to practice sessions, drill sessions, stuff yep. like that. Anything locally, fantastic. And yep. for me, because I don't pack a ton, like I said I traveled with it now once to MLP. Um and it worked out great. Like, I think I carried four paddles with me, a uh, water bottle on the side. It fit perfectly in my overhead um, bin. 
Uh, oh yeah, I should mention that. I did put mine in the overhead bin every time I flew. I did put it under the seat when I got on the plane just to see how it would fit. And the bag fits, but you obviously lose leg room and it does poke out just a little bit, but it does fit down there. Yeah. But for me, comfortably, I would rather just put it in an overhead bin and yep. have the leg room. It's easier to just put it over top. I had a duffel bag for all my clothes and stuff, went under the seat, worked out great. Um, and yeah, the weather resistance is fantastic. I While I was at MLP, I had a drink, uh, a tea, and I put it in the bottle compartment and I didn't realize that there's still a little bit left in the bottom and it spilled all over the side of the bag when we got in the car. And I uh, just w- wiped it down with a little rag with some water and it's perfectly fine so yeah. i think the durability of this bag is great the size is good for me like it's just big enough for me to be able to travel comfortably with it if it was any smaller it'd be yeah. a little too tight there's no way but i would i would like just a little bit more space yeah um but how it is it definitely can work for yeah. traveling so so far still liking the bag still gonna keep using it probably I'd imagine I might try it for like another month before I do a full review on it, just see if anything breaks down. The only thing that broke on the bag, and I believe this is addressed for all future models going forward, is uh, there's like a pull tab so you can like do the zipper. The zipper did not break, but the pull tab that pulls the zipper did rip. And I messaged him about it, and I think he said all of the future ones have a more durable pull tab, and he sent me some new ones, and it does feel a little bit more rugged. So yep. I'll test that, those out and let that, you guys know. That has definitely been the one concern of mine is I, I do feel like sometimes I try to baby the zipper tabs because they are very thin. Um, but yeah, that's if that uh, issue is being addressed, then it's, uh, it's fine. And I'm sure he'd send you new ones. Like the new ones he sent me, like it, so it took like five seconds to put it on yep. and it's fine. So anyways, that's thoughts on traveling with the kitchen bag so far. Still, it's good. Still but. enjoying it. The sunglasses case is one of my favorite parts like i lose sunglasses like crazy yeah. i can fit two pairs of sunglasses in there and it's it's nice having a very dedicated spot for that yeah so, and i've ran into two people now who had them just like out in public i have yep. one person at newport and then one person at uh at mlp mlp so nice that was cool okay that was some of the news uh the main topic we wanted to talk about this week i guess i can just move this over here is should we uncap spin in pickleball so people have been talking about this lately and it's kind of weird to me how this topic came up because I feel like people only started talking about this when there was talks about power being capped. And then everyone felt like, okay, well, if power is capped, we have to change something else, which I don't really understand because I I kind of feel like spin outside of longevity mm-hmm. in paddles is pretty good right now. Like yeah. if you have like a high tier paddle, like I'm not going, man, I just really wish I could spin the ball more. Mm-hmm. It would be cool. Right. But Any, I've never got like anything inside the 1900 to 2100 RPM range feels great. Like, I don't feel like I have any issues being able to spin the ball over the net with drives or rolls yep. or it's not like we're using an original like amped pro. You yeah, know? Exactly. like those things were made of glass. It felt like yeah. very smooth. So personally, I don't really think it's necessary uh, to have a trade off like, oh, we need to drop power and add spin. Yeah. But yeah. I I will say there's some interesting arguments that will go over. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not really for this one way or another. Like if we did it, I'm open to trying it. But I think we have to consider that there are things that it might hurt in the game that might be worse long term. Definitely. So, okay, let me uh, look at this real quick. So first of all, we've played with the gamma ball. Yeah. That little library ball. The foam foam ball. I feel like that gives a small glimpse into what would happen if you had too much spin Mm -hmm. in pickleball. You can add a ton of top spin to that thing because it's foam. It compresses so much. Yep. And it also kind of sticks to the face because the grit like grabs into the like foam, foam. ball. Yep. Backspin on that thing. You hit if you can hit good slice, that ball hits the ground and immediately stops, stops. and goes backwards. Yep. And pickleball, it usually hits and then keeps going forward. It kind of slides. Yeah. Now the one thing I will say is even if we added absurdly more amounts of spin to a pickleball i don't think it would do that yeah, it wouldn't because wouldn't stop it's still it's, it's still slick plastic yeah the foam is going to grab the court surface and want to go backwards almost like what a tennis ball would do yeah so i think even if we added more to pickleball it wouldn't quite do that but yes it's insane if it got to that point yeah so i feel like that is like a decent example of like okay well if we go too far this is what might happen. So mm-hmm. if you guys ever want to just mess with it, mess with a gamma ball and you can kind of see yourself. Yeah. Um, but there are things, here are the things that I think would potentially suffer from the game. And these could also be good things depending on how you want to look at it. Speed ups right now, 
you'd be able to hit a speed up. Like, let's just make up a number. Let's say you uncapped spin, and let's say a paddle could hit like 3,500 RPM or something crazy. Yeah. You could hit a speed up so hard and have that drop at the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we want people to be able to just like blast a speed up like as hard as they can or very hard Mm -hmm. and still have that drop in. Exactly. Or same thing. Now we're just going to have people ripping full speed drives from mid court if you don't hit a great return. And, and you're going to have it like hit your knee. Exactly. It's going to go over the net and just dip right down just past the kitchen. Like that doesn't seem appealing. Yeah. I mean, like right now, at least with a lot of drives, like most of the time you're probably contacting that block or counter like above the net. Yeah. I mean, you could definitely get to a point where all of those you're taking below the net. And now you're just hitting a block. Back. Totally. Yeah. And that might not be inherently bad. I think it just it would just be different. Everyone wants to slow the game down because it's getting too much too powerful but i think if you add more spin to paddles that's just going to allow people to swing harder which means you're going to go right back to that same pace like you're going to be able to hit the ball faster i mean maybe not quite the same pace but i see what you mean like you're not going to have like gen 3 speed for like counters right exactly but you could take larger swings at like the kitchen line and still have a ball stay in drops and stuff will will cease to exist because the more spin you add, people are just going to hit drive drops yeah. and harder drives. Totally. Because they're just going to stay in the court. I agree. And then dinks would be interesting because, like, there's one specific shot, which I probably can't show on screen. But I remember Gabe Tardio, I think he was playing JW at the U.S. Open. And he hit this one, like, two-handed backhand dink. And it just had so much spin on it and landed in the kitchen and took off so quick. It, it was literally just a dink winner. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like JW was way out of position. Like, it was just an insane ding. So I'm imagining if RPMs went 50% higher, 60%, 70% higher, how could you do that on the regular? Right. Maybe that just opens up ATP more. So then, I don't know. It would be interesting because I would. it would be cool to see more athleticism in dinking by moving people around more, opening up the court. Right. But it just makes me wonder if I you I think it would be far. interesting if we did a combination of add more spin to it so you can get those more aggressive dinks and then do like Travis wants. I think Zane was one of the first people to say it is, is add a foot on either side of the net post, like extend the net post. So it gets wider. Um, so you close off ATPs. So it would, uh, that would, I think it would be, this is where like what makes me kind of chuckle with this type of topic is I go, okay, we can make all these changes. We could uncap spin we could move the courts, but now you have to change all the courts in America that have been built or only pros are playing on those courts. Like there's all these things you change and it's like, well, what do we really get out of it? Does it actually make our game more enjoyable? Does it actually make it better to watch? It might, mm-hmm. but is it worth changing everything? I'm good. I have no idea how many courts we have in the U S like 30,000 courts across the country. You know, like, I don't know. It, it could be. But I just don't know. Yeah, it it would definitely be a difficult change to to get that across the whole country. I did, at a minimum, I'd like to see it tried. Like maybe a pro tournament, mm-hmm. they add a foot. Yeah, maybe paddles were uncapped, and it's like, well, let's just see what happens, and then maybe we decide from there if that would be good for the rest of pickleball. Yeah, I would definitely be interested in just seeing it tested somewhere. Have some pros play in a court where they get more spin with paddles, and uh, I don't know, maybe throw some pine tar. Some paddles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and the other thing too that I think would probably I think this is the thing that would break the most. Singles I think is just over. Yep, I 100% agree. You go 3000 RPM, it's over. I mean, passing shots are already insane in pickleball right now. So hard to get to. I think if you ca- uncap that spin even more, you can hit, you know, these weird hybrid drive drops that are a laser to the corner mm-hmm. in the kitchen. And the, the people just aren't going to get to it. Look at when people try to return to Ben's backhand or Jack Sock's backhand. They're going to run around it, and they're either going to rip a drive down the line or they're going to hit a forehand topspin drop to yep. the right corner, Yep. which at the pace we already play at and the spin we already have, may, that shot is extremely difficult to get to. Yeah. You're not going to earn it. You're not going to hit it. At, you're not going to volley it. You have to let it bounce. Now, but you can at least get to it. Now, if you have more spin and more speed, it's just going to, it's going to be a passing shot drop. Yeah. Like you're just not going to be able to get to that ball. So I think singles would be destroyed by uncapped spin. Yeah. I'd be surprised if singles actually got better with doubles. 
I could see it for everything we have said as a potential negative, I could see it also being a pro. Like it could mm -hmm. make things look more athletic. It could make points more entertaining instead of basically standing in one spot. You have to move around and like maybe that makes dinking look more athletic. All of those things in doubles, I see a counter argument. In singles, I don't see a counter argument. Yeah, exactly. I think it's only a downside. It'd be just passing shots will be too good. More tennis players will excel. Yeah. Like Jack Sock. I think if you uncap spin, Jack Sock would be the number one singles player in the in the world. Yeah, it would be insane. Yeah, it, he would just rip rip ground strokes. I think if you added more spin, it would end up being miniature tennis. Yeah, hundred percent. Where you would no just sit one, at the baseline. Exactly. No one's gonna come to the net, and you're just gonna rip ground strokes. So then the two best players in the world are gonna be Jack Sock and Chris Hayworth. Yeah. He just said that recently on a podcast where if it was just baseline to baseline, Chris Hayworth would be the best in the world. That's what he said about that's, himself. That's what he said. Oh, yeah. that's funny. I'd, I'd like to see that now. Exactly. But, and I think that what makes pickleball singles unique is that you do have people come to the net basically every single point, at least on the men's side. And then there is some level of cat and mouse. And I think if you take that away, I'm like, well, this is literally just worse tennis now. Yep. Exactly. And I don't think that's what we want. I think we want the things that make pickleball unique to stay alive. Mm -hmm. The cat and mouse game would, would be gone. It's just that's oh, can you imagine trying to cover a court with that much spin in singles for cat and mouse? It'd be no wild. shot. Yeah, you just get there and you're gonna rip a top spin shot. Oh. So yeah, I don't know. I think singles would pretty much just be over at that point. So I think that's something we have to consider if that would be wise. And mm -hmm. I here's the thing: I don't know what RPM number we would have to cross for the game to start getting too ridiculous. Is it twenty seven hundred? Is it twenty eight hundred RPM? Three thousand? Like I don't know what that number. I think we still have room to go up if we went up 10 percent, 15 percent. i i mean we've seen 2500 yeah and that's everyone on the court has notices when when we've seen that like it's a that's a big jump for yeah. people to see and i think 2500 is the max i think you go over that and it starts you start to hit some some crazy shots i think i mean we've already seen some like trick shot videos of people like bouncing the ball inside the court and hitting an ATP from the yeah. baseline and curving it around, you're just going to see even crazier stuff than that. And I just think, I don't know. I think 2,500 is a good number where we're at right now. Yeah. And I also think too, you know, if you're thinking of what this game is, or at least right now, one of the big appeals is that it's so accessible and people can start and not have it be ridiculous. Like, do we want to raise that barrier of entry where, you know, people coming in are hitting these like crazy top spin dinks against someone who's 70 80 years old and now they're like yeah i hate this game exactly I, I just think there's a lot of things to consider again maybe we could do it and it would be awesome and everything about the sport would get better i think it could i think certain level of players would enjoy it and certain ones wouldn't yeah i think it would be kind of a, a divide there yeah i don't know you guys let us know in the comments what you think and i'd be curious to know if the general like opinion is yeah we should uncap it or if people are like ah yeah let's not go too crazy all right, so yeah, that's our thoughts on that. Uh, we'll move on. We have officially made it to the kitchen. Kitchen time, baby. And we're just going to recap Beer City Open and MLP. Yeah. So if you guys don't know, Beer City Open, I feel like has become like one of the more prestigious tournaments, or at least people really want to go to it. And yeah. I had never been to one. So we actually didn't play in this tournament. We went because our other brother, Patrick, it was his bachelor party. So we took him to an MLP event uh because he had never been to one and he wanted to go to one so we took him to this one and i'm glad it was this one because i've always wanted to go see what the hype about beer city open is so in the past i think they kept the registration around a thousand people ish and in the past it would sell out in five ten minutes like, super fast fastest tournament i have ever seen sell out there was one year i wanted to sign up i missed i had the time reminder wrong and i missed it so I couldn't go. Now I think they do a lottery system because it's so popular that the only way for it to be fair is to let people sign up and then just randomly draw. Yep. So that's how it works now. And uh, I have to say, after being at it and just observing, I get it. You understand. I see why people like this tournament. Yeah. I feel like Andrea does a really good job for the amateurs giving them what they actually care about, unlike a lot of these other tournaments. Mm -hmm. So actually, the only thing that I... Let's go through the things I like, and then I'll get through the stuff I don't like. First of all, the food was great. Yep. Maybe a little expensive, but you know what? At a tournament, you're paying for convenience and like good food. I just expect that. A lot of times what I don't like to see is mediocre food 
and it's expensive. Yeah. Been to plenty of tournaments where there's that. I All the stands at this one, loved it. Yeah, everything was, was great. great. I liked all the food there, and uh, it was quick. It was yeah. fast. Yeah. I didn't have any huge delay waiting for my food, so I thought the food was great. Uh, the turnaround time on games, this was annoying for us, but it's great <laughs> if you're the tournament. Yes. So we were trying to play rec at, like, I don't know, maybe 5 o'clock, and we would just wait for a court to empty, then we'd hop on. A lot of tournaments, you might be able to play a game sometimes half a game i don't know you'll get to play yeah warm the, up play this tournament no two three minutes boom somebody's match walking on back on that court we would literally wait outside of a court for a match to end they're barely walking off the court and we hop on yeah. to play no sometimes they weren't even off the they, court they, they were talking even, to the ref and yeah, we were already they're on it. still on the court and then we would maybe play three or four points and then next players are at the fence saying hey we have a match here yeah. which Yes, annoying for us because we're just trying to goof around, but great for the competitors. Like I, I've, I've I've always said this ever since I was at a Beer City Open. I think it is the best run privately held tournament of the year. Yeah. It is my favorite tournament. Andrea Coop does an amazing job, and I'm sorry I'm blanking out on the the other person she works with who who does a lot of yeah um, setting it. I up. think he. I, sounds like he helps probably during the tournament yes. and Andrew does a lot of the back end before the tournament yep. or the pre prep. They both do a phenomenal job running the tournament. It's like, again, there's cold water buckets everywhere constantly being refilled, which was great. Cause it was so hot. It was so humid and so hot there. I mean, it so necessary, but like they do such an amazing job. Everything's super smooth. Very well done. Like Andrea should just run all the tournaments, cut out all the fluff. <laughs> yeah. There's no like, crazy dj and all this unnest like it's not we're not at a rave we're at yeah. a pickleball tournament all right? right so i think it was it was done very very well yeah no i i completely agree i think if andrea ran or was responsible for amateur tournaments people would be a lot happier paying the prices that they do and the only thing that i would say at this specific location that could have been better is i think no i actually think there were two sets of bathrooms i think i just never went to the other set Mm. Do you know? Because okay, so there was the porta potties, and then I think the women had the like nicer truck. Yep. I thought I saw a sign that said there were bathrooms like behind on the... the food trucks yeah. and stuff. Was I... there? I can't confirm that, but I want to say yes. Okay. Potentially, my bathroom comment is not valid. There might have been other nicer or decent bathrooms, but porta potties never really great. And it's, you know, if you have to use the bathroom, if the I had to be really nitpicky and complain about one thing. It's it's the parking. It's it's kind of yeah. kind of difficult to find parking. You either have to find it somewhere in the neighborhood, or you're walking quarter mile, yeah, half mile maybe tops. So that's yeah. my biggest complaint. Um, but that's really every every tournament's gonna have that. Yeah, a lot so. of tournaments have parking issues, and that's you know less of an organization thing and more of a venue venue issue. that you have. And that, that's another thing I think they do a good job of is they cap it instead of just trying to like make this a money grab and be like oh we want two thousand three thousand people it's like okay we're actually going to cap this at the amount of competitors we know we can handle still turn matches around and fits the amount of courts they have yes so they, they understand have, like, the courts. they understand the facility capacity yeah and i think that manages things very well i feel like at a ppa they're like oh you want 60 people in a 5-0 bracket here you go bro look at yeah. texas when me and will played i mean we had what a 50 team bracket or some absurd it was just Dude, it was way too much. Yeah. So, I, again, props to Andrew. She does an absolutely awesome job with that tournament, and I definitely want to go back. For um, sure. I feel I, like at some point they almost might just need a new venue that has more so they can make it bigger. Yeah. But No, I, I love that place. And it's great, too, If you're if, even if you're there like us who are just there for spectating. The venue is open at night for rec play. Yep. It's a public park. They have fantastic lights. Yep. Courts are open to play. Tons of people come. It's It's great. No, I highly, highly recommend going to Beer City Open if you if you get the chance. And even if it's an MOP and you just want to watch, I think it's probably the best best pick. Totally. Agree. Okay. Uh, oh, also, just thanks to everyone who came up and said hi. There oh, were a yes. bunch of you that came and said hi. And a lot of the conversations were a lot of fun. Like, mm -hmm. I had one really good conversation uh, when I was waiting for my pizza. And they were just super nice people. Like, some of the things you guys said about the content just was very nice to hear. I think there's a lot Refreshing. of small things we do for the content to try and help stand apart. And specifically, there was like one comment someone made to me. I'm not even going to go into it because it's just a technical content thing. But I was like, oh, we definitely put work into that, but no one ever notices it. So I'm 
glad someone noticed it. It's nice to know that it's appreciated. So yeah. big shout out to everyone who came up, said hi. I can't remember all your names. It would take too long to go over all of you, but uh, yeah, it, it means a lot. We really enjoy talking and meeting all of you guys. It was really cool to, to meet everyone out there. Yeah. It's always one thing to like see the comments on a video, but when you actually meet people and like, I don't know, it's just, it's a lot more fun. So totally again, thanks to everyone for saying hi, cause it was a blast. Okay. MLP, let's go over this. Yes. So have you been to an MLP before? Yeah. You, I've been you, to a few. You filmed at one. Yep. Which other ones have you been to? Uh, uh, Dallas, um, Texas right before nationals. Was I at that one? You were not. It was just me. Why were you there and I was? I was working. Oh, okay. Shooting, shooting for some players. Ah, uh, gotcha. I totally don't remember that. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. So, okay. So you've been to one. Yep. I've been to a few. So here's MLP is interesting because I've gotten to a point recently where when it's been online, unless it's the final, I just don't care to watch. Yeah. Especially with the format they've been doing where it's points throughout the season and mm -hmm. there's no like build up to a championship Sunday. Like, oh, you know, this team is facing off this team in the final and you're like, oh yeah, I want to watch that. Now it's like, oh, okay, this team got three points this you, tournament. You played so-and-so and there's no end result. Yeah, so I just haven't cared about it at all this year. But MLP in person is a completely different thing. Way different. Way more entertaining in person to watch than it is online. Like, again, the speed of these players in person is extremely impressive. Like, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But I will still say this. I like watching it, but I definitely have an attention span for how long even in person I can watch before I'm kind of bored. Mm. Because one of the days, I think we sat and watched two full matches, which yep. is probably... That's probably anywhere between two and a half, three hours of pickleball that you're watching. Maybe more, but probably not super likely. Yeah. That's too much pickleball for me to watch. I <laughs> At that point, I just want to play and like... I, my attention does start fading unless the match is really good then my attention is just starts to fade yeah for me I'm similar but it just kind of depends on who I'm watching there's yeah. there's some players that are just always entertaining no yeah, matter totally. what to watch and there's some teams I'm more invested in yeah um but yeah I'm similar two matches and and I'm ready to get moving oh, that's the other thing is like it gets uncomfortable after a while like you're sitting on hot benches it was super hot out and yeah. sunny so that kind of does make it a little bit more difficult to sit there longer. And I do think it will help as player stories get told better or there's more just reason to care about certain players. Mm -hmm. Because I think as you get invested in that, then you're like, oh, yeah, I want to see how this matchup goes. Or as rivalries come up, you're like, oh, yeah, I definitely want to see this. Like if you had two teams and Matt Wright was on one team and Riley Newman was on, I promise you I'm watching that match. 100%. And you're like, I pray they play each other in mixed and men's. Yep. So stuff like that would does make it more entertaining. And I think they need to get more of that to get people to care. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I love watching James. I like watching Zane. Like there's definitely players where I'm like, I'm more invested, but I also know, personally know a lot of these players and that's completely different it, from most people. Yeah. It does change it a bit for us. Cause we actually know these players. Yeah. But yeah, I, uh, I really enjoyed watching. Uh, there was man, this, this tournament, so many crazy tight matches. Yeah. It was insane. I mean, there was a, a score record broken, I think it was 40-38. 40-38, yeah. which is absurd. Do you remember what uh, – was that a mixed match? I think it was a mixed match, yeah. yes. I can't remember the teams exactly. I know it was – I think it was Hustlers and the Squeeze, I think. We didn't actually get to see that match Yeah, we just saw we just saw it announced on Instagram. Yeah, but that's insane. But, yeah, it's crazy. Like, like that match was probably fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was so many super entertaining matches. Like, I always really enjoy watching The Flash. They had a really – Really good tight match. Um, yep. DC is probably my favorite team. I really enjoy watching them. Yep. DC is really good. Yeah. Um, so anyways, fun to watch in person. The We did sit through the entire final because, yep. you know, we're like, okay, well, we're going to watch this whole thing. It's the final. So it was the fives versus DC. So on the fives, you have Annalie Waters, Mari Humberg, Will Howells, Zay Navratil. On DC, you have Dekelbar, James Ignatowicz, Vivian Glosman, and Rachel Rohrbacher. Mm-hmm. And it it was a good match pretty much the entire way through. I think there was only one match that wasn't clo close, and that was men's doubles. Uh, DC won 25-15, which is a big margin. Yep. And actually, MLP. let's real quick, before we get into this too much, I just want to rewind a second okay. and go back to the semifinals okay. with DC and Shock. Do you remember that? 
Oh, man, I'm having a hard time remembering that one. So DC and Shock yep. was a super close match. I can't remember which uh, which teams won which match, but it went to a Dream Breaker. Yeah. And this might have been the most entertaining Dream Breaker I've ever watched. It was it was amazing. Um, do, you, do you not remember this? You're going to have to jog my memory. I remember it going to a Dream Breaker. I just can't remember what. And I remember it being a good match, but I just can't remember what made it so good. Yeah, so it was it was super entertaining. Um, James was playing against Gabe Tardio, yep. and he had one of the most oh, yeah, that, insane points I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, that get I was mean, insane. That get was wild, hitting it back cross court. I mean, his back was turned completely to the court. It was crazy. So that was everyone was on their feet cheering for that. It was insane. Uh, Rachel Warbacher was kind of getting messed up by Anna Bright. Mm -hmm. And so it was a super tight all the way. Uh, And uh, James pulls out insane points near the end. Rachel Rohrabacher ends up winning the match for them against Anna Bright. It it was just super close, very entertaining points. Like, I was super invested watching that. Against the semifinals, making it to the final. Everyone was so, so invested. Again, it's just very entertaining. I, I can imagine watching that online. I'd be watching it and entertained, but I wouldn't be... Yeah. As invested as what was in per- in person. Yeah, I do remember some of that now because I remember thinking during that match, I was like, "Are they going to put in mixed? Are they going to do James against Anna?" Which is what they ended up doing. Yeah, I was like, "Oh boy, I, do like, you, I don't know if that's good." Do you bad. remember in the Dream Breaker, James, a few of those points, he would win and then just stand straight up and stare at the crowd. I mean, he wasn't even staring at the crowd. I think he was just staring at his team. Yeah, hey, but he just on the. I think it was the point he won against Gabe. It looks so funny on Instagram because you just see him turn to the what looks to be the crown he just doesn't just, even move just, he just stare stares. i i thought that was so funny and so entertaining like no screaming no cheering no trash talk just just stare yeah. and i thought that was that was awesome it was pretty funny. so yeah super entertaining watching them make it to the finals yes especially playing against the shock playing against anna bright yeah it was just super entertaining anyways back to the finals yes so men's doubles uh dc wins 50 or 25 15 yep pretty much a blowout and then women's doubles was 25-21. And that match was, I'd love to see some of the points back because uh, DC came out firing with so many neck cords. Oh. I've literally never seen in a pro match this many neck cords. Like even both Anna Lee and Mari were just like, what are we supposed to do? At like, one point, Anna Lee kissed the net. Yeah. <laughs> trying, to, like, trying to gain some, <laughs> some favor points with the net. I mean, it was crazy. There were so many. And I think it wasn't even long after that, like maybe two or three points, another net cord got hit that was a winner, and it was like, oh, my gosh. Like, yep. That was kind of insane to see. But um, the fives do end up pulling that out, 25-21. Yep. It was a close match. was pretty tense. So now it's 1-1. And then it was Deckel and Vivian versus Annalie and Will Howells for the first mixed match, 25-22 in favor of uh, the fives. Mm-hmm. And then mixed two. So DC has to win this match to go to a dream breaker. And they end up winning 25, 23 super. Close. And I was like, Oh my gosh. It was like James for the love of everything. Don't choke. <laughs> Please don't choke. I was and like, I was getting so nervous because he, I still don't know what happened between him and Jade Villiers with that. Oh, that giant that swing, full swing speed up trying to hit James. I still don't know what's all about that, but James was hitting some speed ups that looked like that. Yeah, just, yeah, he hit one, far out. he hit one that just went straight to the back wall. And, uh, I was getting nervous cause he was hitting, hitting a lot of those speed ups out. Yeah. But, so that was super exciting to have that happen to go to a dream breaker. Yep. And then the dream breaker was probably the most dead, even dream breaker. That's probably happened in the history of MLP. Yeah. Split almost two full rotations. Yeah, everyone, everyone just two, 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 two. Everyone was scoring two points, and it was like the score was completely even. At eighteen, eighteen yep. is when it was Zane and, and James. James, and you're like, okay, James. I know Dream Breakers have not been your strong suit, but please, this one, please, time, this James. one time, this one please. time, just needed you to go three straight. And then, of course, Zane, as Zane does in MLP, he just goes three straight, yep. ends up winning it. It was like, I, I mean, and then. Also, the thing you we're thinking about in the audience is we're like, okay, if they split, if they go like two and two and the game stays completely even, and then they the next rotation was Anna Lee Waters and was it Vivian or Rachel? It was Rachel against Anna Rachel. Lee. Yep. And we were like, okay, if it gets to Anna Lee, like this is just over. Like mm-hmm. basically, okay, maybe not over. That's maybe a bit of an exaggeration because I think Rachel did go even with Anna Lee, at least in the first rotation, but 
basically was like okay, highly James, favored yeah it's like you got to win this if you want your team to win this mm-hmm. and Zayn got the three but it was either way super entertaining match the whole way through it's like what in sports it's what you wanted to watch if you're there exactly yeah you don't want a quick 3-0 like it's it, just kind of boring. Yeah, it would have been boring if uh, if they won just three straight or it just yeah complete blowout like twenty five ten matches. Like it's just not not entertaining, not fun. You lose interest very fast after a couple games. This I was on the edge of my seat the in, entire match. Yeah, I'm super entertaining. Uh, it is funny saying that because I was definitely entertained watching it, but. <laughs> I haven't seen the actual clip on TV, but someone sent it to me on Instagram, but they actually, so it was streamed on ESPN, I believe, and they put me on the screen of ESPN, so it had, it was just, they found me in the crowd, and then it said, like, Chris Olsen, Pickleball Studio. Yep. I look pissed <laughs> in this clip. Like, I just look like I don't want to be there, and I'm like, I don't know what part of the match we were in, but this is not how I felt. I was yeah. like, I was like, of course, the one time the camera's on me, I just look like. Well, it's just, dude, it was... As entertaining as it was and excited as I was to be there, it was miserable. I mean, it was so hot. It was, hot, yeah. it was sunny, no wind. Yeah. Very and humid. It, the crazy thing is that day was actually cloudy. The yeah. other days were worse. It was cloudy, and then it would go in and out, and you could see every time a cloud would go away, everyone would look up and go, no. Yeah. So, bit <laughs> bit of a bummer, but uh, yeah, it was still, even with as miserable as the weather was, very entertaining to watch. Yeah. So, I, I kind of feel like... MLP is really entertaining in person. Online, they still got some work to do. Like online, it just kind of looks like like a clown show almost. I don't know. It just something is off. Maybe it's I don't know if it's like a lack of professionalism or I don't know what it is really. But you know yeah. what I think helps a lot? The mics online don't pick up all the trash talk. Yes. The amount of trash talk on the court is insane. It is kind of crazy. Like these are things that I'm like, I've never heard these people say this. And then you're there in person, you're like say it again yeah do it again yeah (laughs) you get you get it's a lot more personal lot you get to hear a lot more when you're there versus online you're just listening even just the audience like yelling stuff is Mm -hmm. funny i really 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 wanted i wasn't gonna do it because i don't want to be that guy but with the amount of net cords that were hit oh my throughout that entire match when james was up against zane and they were about to serve and everyone's quiet i really wanted to yell like Hit him with another net cord. <laughs> but I was like, I can't be that guy. But oh, I thought it would have been really funny. That would have been really funny. So, yeah. But it was really good. I enjoyed it. Um, Beer City Open. Definitely got to go again. For sure. Otherwise, that's about all I got. You got anything else? Mm, no, not really. Nothing much. Just, uh, yeah. If you ever get the chance, make sure try to go to Beer City. It's definitely the best term to go to. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we'll catch you guys next week. Sounds good. Thanks for listening. See ya.